carry on the theme of uh, the Christian and the church. And we're looking at it for the last, uh, I think, one week or two weeks. And uh, we looked at different aspects of why each one of us should be part of, uh, of the body of Christ and how we have to be faithful and be accountable to people above us and also uh, gracious to deal with people whom God puts us uh, as overseers. And uh, as we, as the church grows, the universal church as it grows and as we, our own church grows, uh, there could be problems in the church and we shouldn't leave the church because of problems. So this week we're going to address these issues about how sometimes we get put off by the abuse of gifts in the church and yet we get uh, built up by the use of gifts in the church and how as Christians, as we grow in maturity, how we deal with all these issues. Today we're going to look at this aspect of uh, use and abuse of gifts, especially the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, Verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes about how the manifestation of the gifts is for the common good or the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts are basically uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. As we are filled with the Spirit, He manifests in different ways through us uh, to bless people, and primarily these manifestations or gifts are for the common good. For people outside the church, for us to share the gospel, gifts are very important. And within the body of Christ, to build up each other in the faith. That's the primary purpose of God gifting individuals in the church with various spiritual gifts. These are gifts of grace. In fact, the Greek word used here is charismata. Charismata means gifts of grace. So these are manifestations. And there are seven gifts mentioned, specified, the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 8 to 10. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. And the Lord gives these gifts, manifestation of spirit to different people in the church for the common good for others. It's not for us to show off our gifts. It's not for us to flaunt the gifts God gives us, but rather use it in the proper way, in a biblical way. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And also how sometimes it's possible for us to Abuse those gifts. Now, when God gives a gift, he never takes back. That's God's nature. Romans 11, 29 says, his gifts and his call are irrevocable. His gifts and his call. When he calls his people to do something and they neglect the call, he will not take away the call. It will remain. When you want to come back and and take back what God has given you. He's always there to bless us. So gifts and call are irrevocable. God is so gracious that even when people abuse the gifts, doesn't take away the gift. Because the gift is for the others, for the common good. So let's talk about, first of all, the use of gifts in a biblical way, and talk about how sometimes people abuse the gifts. The primary purpose of the gifts God gives in the church to people is to glorify his name and edify people. The Apostle Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 15 verse 17, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3, is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What's the meaning of glorifying Jesus through the gifts? To glorify means to give him all credit, credit, attributing all honor, glory, 
and on uh, and praise to the Lord, giving Him full credit for whatever we are, whoever we are, whatever He has given us. Now, the other day I was sharing with you about the difference between praise, exalting, and glorifying God. Praising God, exalting God, glorifying God. What's the difference? Praising God is to speak well of Him to people. Speaking well of God. Never complaining, arguing, questioning God. Rather, speaking well of God. Exalting God, exalting Christ to lift Him up. Lift Him up. Glorifying God is to give Him all the credit for whatever He's done in our lives. So, in our service, we glorify Him. That God gives us gifts we attribute all credit to him. It's not for us to show off. When we have gifts from given by the Lord, we shouldn't boast about the gifts. We boast of the giver. We are supposed to boast of the giver. Now let me first talk about gifts to the church. I'll differentiate between gifts to the church and gifts in the church. Let me repeat that. Gifts of God to the church and gifts of God in the church. Gifts to the church are what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. In Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12, we read, So he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service. The body of Christ be built up. We all reach unity in the faith. In the knowledge of the Son of God. So these gifts are given to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service. So who are the servants? Every person in the church is a servant. Every Christian is a servant because a Christian means belongs to Christ. We belong to him because we have been bought by his blood. He died for us to make us his own. And one reason why he died for us was that we live for him. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all that those who live will no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So the primary purpose is for us to be, have, be a salvation. He died for us on the cross, cleanses our sins, makes us his own, and also thereafter to live for him, meaning we do his will. When we do his will, we are default, by default, his servants. A servant does the will of his master. We all have one master and we are all servants. That's why it's written in 1 Corinthians 12 chapter 4, 5, 6. 1 Corinthians 12 chapter 4, 5, 6. There are different kinds of gifts but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, same God works all of it and all men. Different kinds of service but the same Lord. Different kinds of gifts. Same Holy Spirit gives the gifts. He gives the gifts. Different kinds of service. We serve the same Lord in different ways. And therefore, we are one Lord. We glorify Him. And therefore, every one of us is a servant. And these gifts to the church is to prepare God's people for works of service. So we meet on a, on a Sunday morning or wherever, whatever, whichever day of the week we meet. In the Middle East, it is Friday. In the Western world, in India, also it is Sunday. In Israel, Saturday is a Shabbat day. Different, different days. Whenever we meet together, is to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be built up in the faith, to live the Christian life seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The real Christian life is the rest of the week. On a day we meet together as a body of Christ is to be equipped, built up, to grow in faith, to be encouraged, to be refueled, refueling. That's why the church meets together. And, the, and the, 
run throughout the week living for Jesus. So gifts to the church are these ministries. And in the church, God gives different gifts according to his will. Now, interesting thing is, uh, the particular word in the Bible which you all have to, many, many words in Greek which you have to understand, was one particular verse that confuses many people, or two verses. They seem to be contradictory. I'll explain that. In 1 Corinthians 14, chapter verse 1, Paul writes, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Explain the gift of prophecy. Follow the way of love. Our focus is love. We follow love. And we eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Especially the gift of prophecy. Because prophecy edifies the church. As compared to tongues, gift of tongues, it only edifies the person speaking in tongues. When you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. 1 Corinthians 14, chapter verse 4. doesn't edify anybody else unless you have interpretation. So the Apostle Paul exhorting the church in Corinth, seek spiritual gifts, desire spiritual gifts, follow love, but desire spiritual gifts, especially with the prophecy. Fine, that's fine. Now the question comes, why confusion comes? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 says, God distributes his gifts according to his will. Now, if I desire something, how do I know God wants to give it to me? How do I know it's God's will for me? After all, he gives his gift according to his will. How do I know that God's will and my desire both go together? This, this reason only we have to understand the word will used in Hebrews 2.4. There are many words for will in the Greek Bible. Unfortunately, English is very, very poor in its range. Very poor in the range of the language. The same word will has different meanings in the Greek. There's a word called bolema, Acts 13.36, it means purpose. A word called gnome, Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. It talks about how God will judge the world. His way of judgment, will of judgment. A third word is telma. Most common word is telma. Telma actually means wish or desire of God. Used 64 times in the New Testament. 64 times. The most common word is will, telma. It means wish or desire. But the fourth word used in Hebrews 2.4 is telesis. Telesis means inclination, inclination. When you put Hebrews 2, 4 together, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. We desire it. How do you know we are going to get it? Now, Hebrews 2, 4 says, he distributes gifts according to his inclination. When you desire something very, very earnestly, very desperately, with the primary purpose of glorifying God and edifying people, God's inclined to give it to us. We move his heart to give it to us. So our desire and God's inclination, telesis, both will mesh beautifully together. So before we ask God for any gift or desire for some gift, let's be very clear about the use of those gifts. Use should be to glorify the name of Jesus and edify people. Give him all credit for whatever gifts we have. Now we read in the Bible, in the third chapter of Acts, very familiar story, wonderful story, about a healing that took place in Jerusalem. A healing. There was this man more than 40 years old, crippled from birth, kept every day the temple gate called beautiful. Every day he was kept there. For 40 years he was crippled. He was kept there every day. And as he grew up, he must have been asking people for arms. And a very familiar figure, part of the landscape in Jerusalem. And uh, one day, when about three in the afternoon, when Peter and John were going to the temple for time of prayer, they saw this man, as usual, begging for arms. Third chapter of Acts, verse 6, Peter tells him, 
Silver gold, I do not have. What I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. What a man asking for? He's asking for arms. What is Peter saying? I don't have silver, I don't have gold. What I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, walk. What did Peter have? No silver, no gold. He had the gifts of healing. First Corinthians 12 chapter, verse 9. He knew he had the gifts of healing. That he had. He said, and I will walk. And miraculously, the man is healed. A very familiar figure in Jerusalem. 40 years old, more than 40 years old. Every day he was kept there. Which means, he was there when Jesus was walking in and out of the temple. He was there. But the Lord did not heal him. The Lord reserved for Peter and John to heal in Jesus' name. So here is Peter and John. Peter and John, both of them, walking. And Peter is telling uh, this man to get up and walk. And he walks. And everybody looking at Peter. Wondering what happened. Third chapter of Acts, verse 12. He's telling the people, Why do you stare at us? As if by our own power of godliness, we made this man walk. Why is that as, as we made him walk? He goes on to explain how this happened. Acts 3.16 By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom we see and know has been made whole. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that given this man this healing. He is glorifying Jesus. And people look at Peter. They must have thought, well, Peter's made this man walk. Same man was there when Jesus was there. Jesus did not heal this man. How come Peter's doing this? And they're staring at him. And Peter says, why do you stare at us? As if by our own power godliness, we made this man walk. He is glorifying Jesus. In Jesus' name. That's how this man is made whole. Clear example of always glorifying Jesus. Today, when people have gifts of healing, somehow it can make people become very proud as if they are the healer. And sometimes we refer to such people as faith healers. No human being can heal. Only the Lord heals. In Jesus' name, when you pray, they are healed. But he is always Jesus. He is still the healer. Hebrews 13, chapter verse 8. Jesus got the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, even today God gives a gift of healing to people, but we never take glory for yourself. Sometimes even when you pray for people to get healed, or whatever prayer we pray, and when the prayer is answered, there's a subtle pride. I prayed. I prayed. There's power in prayer. Power is not in prayer. Power is in the one who answers prayer. Let me repeat the statement. Power is in the one who answers prayer, not in the prayer itself. Let's we'll never take credit even for prayer. Because even that prayer is by the Holy Spirit. He helps us to pray. Always glory must go to the Lord, never to ourselves. And therefore, a clear example in the Bible. What Jesus did not do when he, when he entered the temple and walked out of the temple, Peter did in the name of Jesus. Jesus' power working through Peter because God anointed him with the Spirit with gifts of healing. So primary purpose of gifts is to, for the other people, to bless people, never for our own show or show off to people. Also, apart from glorifying Jesus, the gifts are given for the building up of people, edification of people. To build them up. Never to take glory for yourself. And uh, there are many spectacular gifts. Like miraculous powers. Prophecy. Healing. They are wonderful gifts. But there is a danger in us sometimes realizing. Oh I have achieved something. I have reached a certain level. We don't reach any level. We receive gifts, grace from God. It's by grace. Grace, grace, nothing but grace. Now, 
when God gives us authority in the, in the, in the body of Christ, it's also important to use the authority for the building up of people. The Apostle Paul, being an apostle, also understood the responsibility he had as an apostle. Very high calling, apostle. Apostle in many ways like a pastor to pastors, overseeing churches, going here and there and building up churches. The word apostle comes from the word apostolos, meaning sent forth. Sent forth to go and minister to different churches and overseeing churches. Very high calling. And as an apostle, he knew God gave him authority to build people up, not to tear them down. For edification, not destruction. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, and Second Corinthians 13, chapter verse 10. Let me repeat that. Second Corinthians 10, chapter verse 8, and 13, chapter verse 10. Both talk about, Paul talks about. Authority God gave him. I thought it means exosia, vested authority as an apostle to build up people, not to tear them down. So the use of gifts should be always to glorify the Lord and think of others more than yourself. It's not about your image, your personality. We're standing in society. Follow God. And God will give us favor, the sight of people. Some will love us, some will hate us. That's part of Christian life. So, when God, when you ask God for a gift, nothing wrong asking God for gifts, including a prophecy, but let the motivation be right. Right motivation. We can ask God for the right things with the wrong motivation. In James 4, chapter verse 3, we read, James writes, you ask and don't receive because you ask the wrong motives. You ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And even when you ask God for gifts, give me the wrong motive. Or if I have healing, all will come to me. If I have prophecy, people will come to me. If I have miraculous powers, everybody will know that flock at my door. It's the wrong motivation. And therefore, let's understand that nothing wrong asking God for gifts, including prophecy. To the members of the church, Paul writes, not necessarily leaders, not just apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, or teachers. For the people in the church, he says, ask for these gifts. Desire these gifts. He's inclined to give it to you. Because you know, he knows that you are available for him, he will use you for his glory. So, Glorifying God, edifying people. Which also means, even today, God give us these gifts. 21st century. Some people think it's all over in the 1st century. And they'll misquote a verse from the Bible. They quote from 1 Corinthians 13, chapter verse 8. Where it says that tongues will stay still, process will cease, knowledge will pass away. Look at the next verse. When perfection comes, imperfection goes away. Now we see in a part, later we see the whole. Meaning, when Christ comes the second time. Till he comes the second time, his gifts will still be operational. Because as long as people need to be edified, people need to be saved, God will give us his gifts for the common good. It's not for showing. So that's very clear for us, I hope. Using gifts for his glory and building up people for other people's sake, not to flaunt our spirituality. Now, I told you, when God gives us gifts, he will not take away. Now, sometimes it's possible we abuse the gifts. How? Because he won't take it away. And once you become very popular in your ministry, it's possible to take advantage of popularity especially in the area of gifts of healing. Because there are people who use the gifts, even the word of God, for profit, for money. In 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 2, Peter writes, the shepherds of God's flock. Be shepherds of God's flock. Not because you must, but because you're willing. 
as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those interested in you, but being example to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, we see the crown of glory, which will never fade away. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Sometime when God gives us gifts, we have temptation to use that gift to make money. And the apostle Paul wrote about people during his uh, contemporaries in the, in the kingdom of God. Second Corinthians 2.17 Unlike so many, we don't peddle the word of God for profit. On the other hand, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Unlike so many, majority were peddling the word of God for profit. The gifts of God, not just the word of God, even the gifts of God. It could be happening even in the contemporary world today. How people sometimes use their position of ministry and the gifts they're given to in fact force people to contribute to the ministry. They compel people. Now if you look at 2 Corinthians 9 chapter from verse 6, we read, Paul writes, remember this, he who so sparingly will reap sparingly. He who so generously will reap generously. Each one must give but it is in his heart to give. Not reluctantly, or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Even the ministry is a wonderful thing. It's a very blessed thing. Acts 20.35 The Apostle Paul quoting the words of Jesus, he says, it's blessed more to give than to receive. But then, here Paul writes, you must give generously. Don't be under compulsion. And many people in the ministry especially gifts of healing and very glamorous gifts, they compel people to give to their particular ministry. And you know what? When you give, you're disobeying God. Don't give reluctantly, give generously, but don't give under compassion. When they compel you and you give, what are you doing? You're disobeying God's word. From the point of view, people who have these gifts, it's important to trust in God for your resources. Don't use gifts for money. You correlate the two. Because when you serve God sincerely, God will move people's hearts to contribute to the ministry. So you can abuse the gifts by using those gifts to try to constrain people to give to because Oh, he's a man of God. If I refuse him, I'm like, it's like refusing God. No man is God. God is God. We are all sinners saved by the grace of so the gifts of healing is one area where people can misuse. The gift of the word can be an area where people misuse. Using God's word and quoting God's word selectively to constrain people to contribute for personal gain. Abusing the gifts. Now what happens is God will still use people. Like I told you, he will never take, he will never take back the gifts. Gifts are there. But then a person with the wrong motivation in ministry cannot have the true peace and joy of ministry. May still be blessed. Even through disobedience, God will use us. Moses struck the rock twice. And God said, because of this, you will not enter the land of Canaan. He says, speak the rock, he struck it twice when people are compl complaining about no water. And in disgust, he didn't glorify God. He said, do you want us to bring you water from the rock? He told the Israelites. He struck the rock twice out of disgust. But water still came from the rock. A miracle happened to quench the thirst of approximately 2 million people. From a rock, 2 million people their, their thirst was quenched. God is a miracle in spite of disobedience. He will do his work. But are we enjoying the walk with God? Are we enjoying our ministry? That's the fundamental question. Not only really gives a healing. Even the gift of, a simple thing, the gift of tongues, you can abuse. Because if you look at 1 Corinthians 14 chapter, verse 18 and 19, the apostle was addressing the issue about tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than any one of you. But in the church, I rather speak five intelligible words to instruct people, 
than 10,000 tongues. Tongues without interpretation only edifies the believer, which means in, in the church meets together, we should not speak in tongues unless we have interpretation. In fact, if you look at a few verses down, verse 27 and 28, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, 14 chapter, 27 28, Paul says, two or three should speak in tongues, one after another, and one must interpret. But don't have interpretation, don't speak in tongues. How many judges today, they loudly speak in tongues without interpretation? That's an abuse of gifts. Gift is there. But then you abuse it. Why did they speak loud in tongues loudly? To show off. I got tongues. You have got tongues? It doesn't glorify God. Paul says, I speak more than all of you. In the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words. People can say amen to it. And to instruct people rather than 10,000 tongues. 10,000 words in tongues. So this is one area where many churches, they, every Sunday, they misuse, they abuse the gifts. This particular gift is a wonderful gift. Tongues is a wonderful gift. Because it edifies yourself. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. But sometimes you know, like for example, when I, when I minister in the church, in my own church, I, uh, I do some revival meetings sometimes. And uh, when I know there's going to be interpretation, then I speak in tongues and interpret myself. One sentence in tongue, one sentence in, in English. For people to understand. But if I know there's no problem interpretation, I can sense in my spirit, I quietly pray at home in tongues, not publicly. Having said that, in some parts of the country, some parts of the world, especially northeast of India, when the church meets together, uh, they have what they call a time of mass prayer. Mass prayer. Everybody prays at the same time. When you do mass prayer, you're not listening to the next person. You're praying to God yourself. Now, you're not praying, listening to somebody to say Amen. Why does Paul say, don't speak in tongues publicly? Because the person listening to you with no interpretation doesn't understand what you're saying. How can he say Amen to your prayer? He can't say Amen. So don't pray in tongues publicly. Whereas when you pray when nobody's listening to you, they all pray themselves, then you can pray in tongues. Because in the Northeast, for example, they all have a tribal language. They say, let's have mass prayer. Everybody is praying. They are praying their own tribal language. I am praying in my own language. I am not listening to them. They are not listening to me. That time I can pray in tongues. Because no one is listening to me. They don't, I don't expect them to say amen to my prayer. There are exceptions, exceptions like that. But when you do this only to show off your spirituality, then it doesn't please God. It's not sin. It doesn't please God. We are here to please God. Doesn't edify people. And therefore, quietly pray in tongues, pray you and God, and uh, never flaunt your gifts. It's always for the edification of people, your own edification, tongues, of course. So, nothing wrong asking God for these gifts. They're as much for today as 2000 years ago. And therefore, let's understand God wants to desire these gifts. Because some of these gifts are very, very important for the ministry of evangelism, for bearing fruit in our lives, fruit of the Spirit, very, very important. I mean, I did a study on fruit of the Spirit, how the gifts are important for the fruit. If you have time, go to the peak load and check out on that. Gifts required to bear the fruit. Some people say, who are against the gifts of Spirit, they say, oh, they're not important. They're all gone in the first century. What is important is the fruit. Food is the most important. Of course, it's important. But we can't bear the fruit without the gifts. There are some gifts given to us by which we bear the fruit. Everything is from the Lord only. Without Him, we can do nothing. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, one more aspect of abuse of the gifts is gifts given to the church. And those people are gifted to the church can also abuse their gifts. Like, for example, leadership in the church. I am an apostle. I am a prophet. I am a pastor. I am a teacher. Listen to me. Don't talk anything against me. Now, they'll use one, they'll misuse a verse in the Bible which says, Psalm 105, verse 15. God says, Psalm 105, verse 15. 
do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. He'll misquote that verse. That verse said, don't do harm to my people, my leaders, my appointed leaders in the church. Don't do harm. They'll misquote that and say, don't correct me. I'm a pastor. How can you correct me? No, correction is not harming. Correction is building up. 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 16, 17. All scriptures, God breath. We said about teaching, correcting, rebooking, and training in righteousness. That the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for a very good work. In the body of Christ, correction is very, very important. Correction is for building up the other person. So when a leader in the church does something wrong, and people want to go and correct him, and he says, oh, I'm a leader. How can you correct me? Who are you in the church? I am the leader. And you are, though no, you cannot correct me because God's word says, don't touch my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. We're not doing harm. We're doing good to the person. When I correct someone in love to build up that people, build up that person, is doing good to the person. And therefore, by all means, in the body of Christ, we have to correct our leaders in love, one to one. Don't go and talk behind the back. No question of gossiping in the church. It displeases God. Gossip displeases God. Slander displeases God. Malice, malice displeases God. Rather, one to one go and correct. And it's possible that the position of authority God has given to certain people, they'll abuse that. I'm a leader. You're a mere member. Not even a member in the church. You just came day for yesterday. But the point is, he or she is a child of God. We are all children of God. We are all important for God. And therefore, by all means, don't get intimidated by people who use authority, abuse authority, say, don't ever talk to me. Your Bible says you should not correct. Of course, you have to correct. Which also means, those in leadership should have the discipline to accept discipline. Discipline, to accept discipline for our benefit. Even God disciplines those whom he loves. He loves us so much, he disciplines us. It's very important to be disciplined. All of us have to go through this. I've gone through the discipline. Thank God for people who corrected me for when I went wrong. And why does God discipline us? That we share in his holiness. That we share in his holiness. That's why he disciplines us. What an amazing God we serve. And therefore, don't let people abuse the, the, the position they have authority in the church. Tell them very clearly. See, you are a child of God. You are more answerable to God than others as a leader, as a teacher of God's word. Therefore, we have to correct you for your good. The primary purpose, like I said, of correction is that the other person, after correction, becomes a better instrument in the hands of God. Please don't correct because you want to set the score level. Earlier the man corrected you. Score was 1-0, you make it 1-1. One, one. Sort of football match. Not to settle scores. So in the body of Christ, it's very important that we all are there to help each other, to encourage each other in the faith. So when we ask God for his gifts to be used for building up people and glory of him, you can be sure he will answer. He loves it when you ask him. He can give it to us without asking also. And when you ask him, keep on desiring with all your heart. I'm sorry. When you ask with all your heart, then uh, you can be sure he'll give it to us because he loves to give it to us. He knows apart from him, we can do nothing. John 15 to 5, Jesus said that. With him, we can do all things. So always question your motivation. Now, in our desire also, he examines the motivation. Actions he examines. Mind he examines. Motivation behind that. When all is clean before God, we'll have full confidence he will give us what we ask of him. 
Now, when you find certain things happening in the church today, because of which you get put off by that, don't question somebody's calling just because he's abusing the gifts. Sometimes what happens when people abuse the gifts, no? Oh, I don't think this man is working by the, living by the Spirit. He's not missing my Spirit. Remember, the gift God gave him, he won't take back. Gifts are operative. But, he's using the gift for his own personal glory. And he says in Romans 14.4, Romans 14.4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master, he will stand or fall. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Shouldn't judge someone. One to one, go and tell them, correct them. But judging behind the back, talking behind the back, this please is God. He is God's servant. And Paul writes very clearly to the Romans. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? He is God's servant. Who are you to judge? To the one master, he will stand or fall. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. When you find someone who is wonderfully by God in various gifts and then you find that he's um, using it for money or whatever, don't question the source of that gift. Source is the same, God. It's just that he's abused it. God won't take it back. Don't question the giver based on the recipient. It very often happens in the churches today. People, I put off by this church. This man is like that. That man is like that. I'm going away. If you're looking for a perfect church, you'll never find it. There's no perfect church except perfect by the blood of Christ. None of us is perfect by ourselves. No church is perfect by herself. Christ makes us perfect. The church is made up of imperfect people. We're all called to follow the perfect Jesus. We're all imperfect by ourselves. So you're looking for a perfect church, you'll never find it. And those who keep on skipping churches, hopping churches, will keep on hopping. Keep on hopping. They never, feel, they never find a perfect church. Wherever you are, God has put you. Stay there. Be an instrument of change. And see how you can be a blessing to the church. So often people ask this question. I don't want to carry on this church because I get nothing from it. I get nothing. My question is, why do you want to always get? Why can't you give? What can you give? Ask God, or can, or how can I help this church, Lord? You can encourage people, pray for people. God hears our hearts. When you desire to be a person, to be a blessing to others, you can be sure God will make you a blessing. He wants all his children to serve him. Every one of us is a servant of God. And apostles, prophets, Evangelists, pastors, teachers were given to the church to prepare God's people for works of service. What an amazing joy it is to be a servant of God, to be a child of God. For me, they, when people had asked me to speak in different meetings, they asked, how do you want us to introduce you? How do you want me to introduce you? I'll say, just tell them, I'm a child of God. My name suggests that, Rajkumar. Rajkumar is what? Prince. A prince because the father is king of kings and lord of lords. All of us have a father who is king. We are all princes. That's enough. Child of God. A bonus is servant of God. Child of God. Basic qualification. <laughs> and bonus, servant of God. Nothing more we need to be introduced. Not about personal glory. All about Jesus. Glorify him. Edify people. And you can be sure God use all of us for his glory. Let's pray.